Good evening. So in about two hours, I'll be getting home, and um, I've got a couple kids at home, and I uh, will walk in the door, and I'll say something like, how was your day today? And I can almost guarantee you I'll get at least one. Good. Um, so it's not really the answer I'm kind of looking for. I'm sort of looking for something that actually is interesting. You know, did it go well? Did it go poorly? Um, but apparently, maybe I'm answering or asking the wrong question, or maybe I'm just not saying it the right way. But somehow, I'm not getting the, the kind of the answer. Just kind of good doesn't really tell me all that much, um, especially since it's pretty much the same kind of answer I get every day. So you know, I have to think about what kind of question. How can I how can I reframe my question? Well, today's talk is about measurement in clinical research. So. What we're going to talk about is a little bit this question of, you know, how do we ask the right questions? Um, how do we come up with a measure that's going to give us uh, something that we're actually interested in, something that's going to uh, answer a scientific question? And what kind of, what are the fundamental principles that uh, we need to think about when we're talking about um, asking questions and looking at measurement? So my name is Dave Luckenbaugh. I'm a medical statistician in the National Institute of Mental Health. Most of my work has been over the last 20 years in depression, uh, a lot of clinical trials, biomarker studies, all kinds of different things related to, to depression, um, bipolar illness also. Uh, one of the things I really like about NIH is that there's just so many different things going on. Just as I think I know uh, a little bit about what's going on, turn the corner or somebody uh, has a new lecture and there's something completely different um, that I really hadn't been thinking too much about. Uh, so it's a really kind of a, a neat place to be, uh, not only to do statistics, but just to think about science. I've um, been in this lecture hall many times to, to hear different people talk. So then our objective today is just to talk about these fundamental principles behind what a measure is and uh, think about how it fits into clinical research. So over the summer, I was at a, a baseball game, and I saw... Uh, a few parents holding up these little rectangular things, and I was kind of curious what they were. Of course, I've been to games before, so I had a pretty good idea. And what they were were speed guns. Their kids were pitchers, and they were trying to uh, get a sense of how fast their kid was throwing because, you know, if you, the harder you throw, the more likely it is you can get into a school, get a scholarship. Um, unfortunately, the numbers weren't quite as high as they wanted them to be. What was really interesting is I was standing about 10 feet back, from these parents is to see some of the numbers. You know, you have two parents standing right next to each other with exactly the same device, and sometimes they'd get different numbers. You know, sometimes, you know, it doesn't surprise me, you're off by like one, two miles an hour. Uh, but every once in a while, you see like an eight flash up. Um, you would have a hard time taking a ball and throwing it probably eight miles an hour. Um, even if you gave a two-year-old a ball, you would have a difficult time doing that. So some of the readings just didn't make sense. Um, so. Probably what's happening is something environmental. Maybe they move the sensor or something like that. Uh, but again, these are some of the things that we're going to talk about um, when we talk about uh, different kind of measures. And just one other kind of example to get us started is one thing that I really like um, to, to think about is um, places where you have opportunities to get lots of different measures at once. Uh, you're all familiar with treadmills, I'm sure. One of the interesting things there for a statistician is you have numbers flashing all over the place. You've got how fast you're going, how long you've been going, how far you've been going, how many calories you've burnt. So among the questions we have to ask is, which one do we care about? Do we care about all of them? Maybe. Or is there one that's more important that's really going to answer the kind of question that we have? So we'll talk a little bit about uh, some of those kinds of things. So when we talk about measurement, uh, we sort of have to talk about constructs first. So construct, a construct is just kind of a general idea around or theoretical concept uh, that you want to tap into in any kind of research. Uh, it's not necessarily, it's not associated with any measure. The measurement is sort of how you're trying to tap into this construct. So I might talk about um, depression as a, a construct that we use for um, the studies that I work in, um, but there's usually different kinds of measures that we use to try to get at that particular construct. Um, and 
a lot of times we talk about operational definitions. So your measurement might be a specific measure that you're using. So for example, if you take a construct like um, maybe um, exercise or health, you might look at something like performance on a treadmill as some kind of measurement, and your operational definition might be something like how far can somebody run, how many calories do they burn in an hour, something along those lines. So then just as an example, I mentioned working in depression. Um, some of the kinds of scales that we use, a lot of the scales, a lot of the things we use to get at depression severity are um, questionnaires. Uh, Hamilton Depression Rating Scale is a clinician rated scale. The Beck Depression Scale is a, a patient rated scale. So they give you a little bit different answers depending on the, con uh, on the context that you're in. I also have uh, worked in a group or with a group who was working with uh, tremor and one of the measures that was common in tremor was to give people this sort of shell-shaped pattern that they had to trace and depending on how far you were off of the actual line that was there would give you an indication of the tremor um, but then they developed sort of a computer algorithm to evaluate the tremor so here you have two different kinds of definitions you have kind of a visual look at where someone's drawings are versus something more like um, a computer evaluation of the same line. Then with heart disease, you might have something like a cholesterol level, C-reactive protein, heart attacks. Um, so you can sort of pick your field and think about what kind of measures that you might have. So the general outline of the talk, uh, we're going to talk about first validity, uh, then reliability, sensitivity to change, Really, um, reliability, sensitivity to change are sort of more the focus. We'll talk a little bit about scale at the end, and then a little bit about kind of the feasibility of measures and a few things you might think about in trying to decide on, on what kind of measure you use. So let's start with validity. I said I liked baseball. My son's a pitcher, uh, so I thought this was good. So when we're talking about validity, um, we're talking about whether you actually touching the construct that you're interested in. So if you're interested in exercise performance, um, how well does whatever measure you have actually touch on exercise? Um, if you talked about like something like walking, does it kind of fit? So what we want to have is we want to have, whether it's questions or some kind of measurement that actually hits that construct right on the head. So kind of hit the target right in the middle here. So if you look at something like this, um, when I think about depression scales, uh, we have scales that have five questions, we have scales that have 17, 10, all kinds of different numbers. And some of the questions are actually fairly interesting. If you think about depression, you have some scales that ask you a lot of sleep questions. How well did you sleep last night? Did you sleep early in the night? Did you sleep late in the night? Some of them actually don't have any sleep questions. So they're looking at different kinds of views of a construct. And what we want to know is, so if you look at the uh, target on the left, here would be a place where all of your questions fit right into the construct. They're, uh, they, they might even be fairly obvious. Um, then you might have a situation where you have a bunch of different questions, maybe one or maybe even none of them, um, hit the construct very much right at the target, um, but then you have other questions that don't really hit the, the construct very well. Um, so those would be questions that you might even want to eliminate from a scale because they're, they're, it could be actually hurting your validity, hurting how well you're tapping into a construct. Um, and then you could have something that you have a bunch of questions that hit one area, like sleep, for example, um, but they might not be exactly uh, what the construct is. So if I only ask sleep questions and I'm, my interest is in depression, then I probably haven't really hit depression right on the head here. So there's different kinds of validity you might think about. Uh, first of all, face validity is kind of the first thing that uh, people would think about. Um, these would be, so something would be face valid if you have a question that obviously uh, touches into your construct. If I'm interested in sleep and I ask you, how well did you sleep last night? It's pretty obvious one fits the other. You probably will find a lot of places that you, you can get questions like that. Pretty simple. Um, then you have, oops content validity. So this is, this is thinking about, and again, let me use depression as my example here since that's the area I know best. 
Um, so this would be, when we talk about depression, there's just so many different kinds of symptoms. You can have a lack of energy. That could be part of your depression. You could be sad, which is what most people think about when they think about depression. Again, I can say so you could have sleep problems. Um, you could have physical symptoms that might go in. So content validity refers to how much of a construct are you tapping into. So if I'm thinking about depression, sadness is a piece of it but it's not the entire sense of it. So what I want to do is I want to have components of my measure that tap as much of that construct as possible. Unless, of course, you kind of narrow and you only want to know a piece of that construct. So then a couple other things to think about are, are um, convergent validity. So convergent validity people think about when they have a new measure and they're trying to figure out whether it's going to work fairly well. So convergent validity would be something like taking a new scale and seeing how well it correlates with the old scale. Presumably, you should have, you know, if, if you're talking about something like tremor, if you take one measure of tremor and you take the, another one, they should fit together reasonably well. They might not be perfect. If they, if they were perfect, then you probably wouldn't need the new one as much unless it costs less or something like that. Um, so convergent validity, so whenever you're studying a, a new scale, you want to know that it fits in with the old scales to a certain degree. But you also want to know something about divergent validity. So if you're studying a new measure, you want to include some things that should not be related to your construct. So for example, if you take something like um, um, uh, I guess diversion with validity in, in the context of depression, I mean, you might look at something like um, uh, maybe a reaction time. A reaction time could be important if you expect some kind of slowness, so it could be something that would work very well with depression, um, but it also could be something that, depending on the kinds of symptoms that you want to look at, it might not correlate well. So. Um, Maybe another example of something that would be uh, divergent validity is take a couple different imaging measures. Um, you might look at something that's looking at glucose metabolism, and you might look at something that's looking at a different kind of metabolism. You wouldn't probably expect those two different types of metabolism to have the strongest correlation. But if you had two measures that are looking at glucose metabolism, you would expect those to fit together fairly well. So when you have two measures of glucose metabolism, you're talking about convergent validity. When you have one that's glucose metabolism and the one that's some other kind of metabolism, then you would be talking about divergent validity. It's important to show that there's some things that are correlated with things and some things that are not. OK, okay so that's just a quick piece on, on validity. So I want to spend a lot of time on reliability, largely because reliability is something that you can do something about. Um, it's something that um, there's a fair number of issues. It can be very important for your sample size, the size of the studies that you have. It's important for a lot of different reasons. So let's use a similar example um, for reliability as we did with validity. So reliability has more to do. It doesn't really have to do so much with your construct. It has to do with how consistent you are. So in this case, if you are, whoops. In this case, if you're really consistent, you're hitting the target right in the middle, you're going to have high reliability. If you look at this picture here, you can have high reliability whether you hit the target or whether you don't hit the target. But you're consistently, whoops, you're consistently hitting the same spot. If you want to have the best measures, you want to have something that's really reliable, something that's really consistent that you can count on. Um, so if you have one person who gives a measure and a different person give a measure, you want to get pretty much the same score, for example. Um, if you have something like this, where you take multiple measures and they end up all over the place, this is not reliable. Um, it's going to be really hard to understand what's going on with your data, because essentially you have a lot of error. Here, you might be off some regular amount, but you may be able to make some kind of adjustment for that. Here, if you're consistently right on target, you're consistently on the construct, then you have really strong reliability. So you need to think about not only do you tap into the construct that you want, but how consistently do you do that. So then in this kind of case here, I just emphasize, you know, if you're hitting right in the middle of the target and you're doing it consistently, you have the most valid and most reliable measures. If you're way off the target, there's no discernible reason for why these Point, these 
um, attempts at hitting the target are off, then you have both um, invalid and unreliable measures. So you can also have this case where you're getting consistent results, but you're not hitting your target. So this doesn't help you too much because you don't know really what you're measuring here. So let's talk about different types of reliability. First of all, you have internal consistency. So when you set up a, create a questionnaire or, or a series of tasks, uh, what you want to do is you want to have tasks that are going to, to fit together. Um, you want your items on your scale to be related to each other. You want to have something that is going to, um, um, you're going to have one, want to have individual items that have something in common with each other. Um, that commonality is going to get you to your construct. So uh, just I, I could have put it up, whoops, could have put it up here. Um, but one measure that you can use to get at internal consistency is Kronbach's alpha. It comes out kind of like a correlation measure. The higher value you have, closer to one, the more consistent you have. And you can use Kronbach's alpha to figure out uh, how consistent your different items are. As you get lower, uh, you might pull items out of your scale. As you get higher, you might leave items in. So then you have inner rater reliability. So this is the case where uh, you have so in, in our, on our unit, we have a lot of different, uh, generally, nurses who are doing the ratings. And we'd like to know, from one nurse to the next, are we going to get the same kind of results? So some of our clinicians do training with the raters to make sure that they, they are going to give fairly consistent measures. And we'll talk a little bit about how you can boost up inner rater reliability. So what you want to avoid is having one rater on day one give some number and then have a second rater a week later who gives a totally different score, but not because there's any change in the measure, it's just because there's a difference between the raters. So you need to make sure that if you have multiple people doing rater ratings that they're going to be consistent. And then test-retest reliability would just be uh, when you take measures at two time points that are close together, you want to have some consistency in those time points. You don't want to have a lot of variability um, just due to time unless you have some kind of intervention that you're expecting to change over time. Okay. So why should you care about reliability? The main reason you should care about reliability um, is um, it can cause all kinds of error. So if you have a pen or a pencil, I want you to just take that piece of paper and draw a circle. Okay, you got your circle. Now draw another circle. Okay, so essentially what we did here is just take a look at your circles. How similar are they? Are they the same size? The same shape? Uh, did you press down a little bit harder on one? Or maybe one you didn't quite finish? Um, one maybe you drew one inside the other? Um, if I was thinking about reliability, I would want to know from, um, so this is kind of your test retest. I think I'm covering the thing. This is sort of your test retest reliability. Do you give the same, do you get the same measure when you have the same question? Um, if you look at the person next to you or closest to you or over somebody's shoulder, um, this here should be your inner rater reliability. Did you draw the same circle? Is it the same size, shape, color even? Um, so here's your inner rater reliability. Each of these things, if you don't have consistency, um, you're going to create more error in your data, and you're going to create a lot of different kinds of problems. So for example, if you increase your reliability, um, you're going to have, or if you decrease your reliability, you're going to have less sensitive statistics. The reason that is is that the error in your data is going to be increased, and you're not going to be able to see the signal or, or the difference between your groups. Um, so what that can lead to, as you have greater error, um, it can lead to uh, requiring a larger sample size. Um, the smaller difference that you can see, uh, the more difficult it's going to find. So you're going to have to increase your sample size to see that small difference. And ultimately, it can lead to not having interpretable uh, statistics. 
um, again, because of, of the, the big error that you have there. So take a look at this for just a second. So let's say you have some known difference between your groups. This is a study maybe you've done before. And you need to know for the next study how many people you need to include. What most programs will do is they'll assume that you have pretty much perfect reliability. So this is for, for those of you who are familiar with effect size, it's kind of a moderate difference, a significance level 0.05, about 80% power, um, two groups. Um, so what you would need for a moderate difference, if your reliability is perfect, is about 128 people. That's 64 people for each of two groups. Again, this means that your raters are giving exactly the same answers whenever they fill out your questionnaire. Uh, your radar gun is working exactly the same. You're getting the same rating. Um, for the same performance each time. So let's just drop that down a little bit. Let's just drop it down to, let's say, about 20%. So here you go from needing 128 people to 200 people. Um, if you're like my group in the intramural program, you know, we do studies with 30, 50 people. You know, we don't have time or money to do much bigger studies. If we drop, if our reliability drops, that's a lot of, that's a lot more people. Um, if you drop it down to about 0.6, which is a considerable, <laughs> a considerable drop, you're talking about tripling your sample size, pretty much. So what you want to do is you want to make sure that um, you reduce the amount of error that you have in your data due to the measurement. So this is just, again, this is the sample size here. Here's your reliability coefficient. A one would be perfect. Everything is perfectly consistent. Um, I would say that most studies that I see, if you have a pretty good measure, it's probably in the 0.7 to 0.9 range. So then, what can you do to improve your reliability, make your statistics more sensitive? There's actually a really nice article by Helena Kramer. It's really uh, pretty old at this point, um, but um, it's a really, uh, really great article. It talks about a lot of these issues around reliability. The title of the article is something along the lines of how to improve your reliability without increasing your sample size. So nobody wants to have to collect more data if they don't have to. So the first thing is, is standardizing your procedures. So for the people holding the gun up at the, at the pitcher, um, I can tell you from having played around with these things now, just a slight tilt in the angle that you hold the gun will change the number that you get dramatically. So maybe instead of having, uh, holding it, you might have a tripod that you put it on. You know, fairly simple. So you can come up with any kind of, uh, any way that you can make these simple. So for our depression measures, uh, there's a fair number of, for the Hamilton depression scale, for example, uh, there's a fair number of guidelines for how do you read certain questions, how do you rate higher or lower scores on individual items in order to make it easier and more consistent for whoever's doing the rating to give the same thing over and over when they see the same kind of performance or the same kind of behavior. Uh, the next thing is training your raters. Um, if, you're not, if you're doing questionnaires and you're not training your raters, I would highly encourage you to do that. So essentially what you're doing when you're training your raters, you're giving them some kind of standardized procedures to follow. I know it's interesting actually to talk to some of the people who do the training in my own group because they'll tell me that, okay, well, I can tell you that there's this one person who really is not consistent with the rest of the people. And for whatever reason, no matter how much training we do, um, we just can't get that person to be consistent. Well, unfortunately, any data that's coming from that rater is probably not going to be as reliable and probably um, you can't expect to depend on the results that you get from that person. So it might be that we sort of whoops, have to force uh, somebody or do even more training with that person. So not only do you need to train people, but you also have to monitor them to make sure that they keep up. There's a, there's a huge amount of literature on monitoring raters 
pretty much works that the more often you do it, um, the more often you check to make sure that you have reliable raters, uh, the better off you're going to be, the less error you're going to have, the smaller sample size you're going to need. Um, so what does monitoring mean? It may mean um, redoing your training. It may be doing something like, um, again, I'm in, in behavioral health, so it might be uh, getting a videotape of a patient and having everybody sit in the room and come up with a rating and then talk about the rating. How did it go? What, you know, where do we have problems? Where do we have disagreements? And figure out where the problems are. I can tell you it's, it's, it's interesting because I get to see some of this reliability data from our own group. Every once in a while there'll be somebody who has a completely different perspective on one symptom. Um, whereas you can have a zero to four scale for a symptom, you might see everybody giving threes and fours and then one person give a one. Well, I can tell you that we do look at individual symptom data sometimes, so whenever we do that, I get a little nervous because I know that for individual symptoms, um, you can get much more variability. But when you average the values together, so if you take a long questionnaire, you average them together, what's going to happen is you're probably going to boost your reliability. So among the suggestions in this article are um, you can use multiple raters to come up with a final rating. So sometimes in our group we call these consensus ratings. So we may have two or three different people who actually rate the patient and then they get together and agree on what kind of the final answers are. Um, yes, it takes more time, but if the solution or if, if the outcome gives you much better data, then you know, you're going to definitely be better off. The other thing you can do is you can take repeated observations. So for example, if you, on, if you only have one person who can do ratings and you know that whatever you're testing is going to be fairly stable for a couple weeks, you might take observations within that period that's supposed to be stable. Average those and then you'll get a much more reliable and more stable answer um, than what you would have had with just a single observation. There is a point where taking repeated observations gets to be way too much. Um, this article, I think, and actually some articles following it, uh, it gives some information on you know, when do you need to do more, when do you need to do less. There is definitely a point where it gets to be ridiculous to take. You don't want to take like 10 ratings in a time period. You don't expect much change at all. Um, but these are a couple things that you can do in order to um, try to improve your reliability. So generally, people know about validity a little bit, reliability a little bit when they're talking about um, looking at measurement. But what often happens when I'm talking to somebody about their new study is that they don't really know a lot about sensitivity to change. Um, this is also in some fields, you might know it as responsiveness. I see sensitivity to change more often, so that's why I use it here. Um, but they're the same, they're interchangeable, at least the way I'm using them here. So what is sensitivity to change? So if I'm doing a clinical trial and I want to know whether someone's um, depression is going to improve, I want to be sure that um, over the period of time obser I'm observing that that measure actually can change. You might say, well, of course anything could change. But if you ask different kinds of questions, um, just like the color of your skin, unless you've been out in the sun, is probably going to be fairly stable over time. There's lots of characteristics that are going to be pretty stable over time. You want to make sure, if you're doing a clinical trial, that you have a measure that you can actually see some kind of change. So one way to measure this is something that I learned as Cohen's D. Um, what this is, is just a measure, uh, it also goes as a standardized mean difference, I've seen in many places. Um, it's just, whoops, it's just looking at uh, the difference between your groups divided by the standard deviation. This just gives you some sort of standard interpretation of this. A point age, 0.8 is kind of a large difference. 0.5 is generally considered moderate. A 0.2 is a small effect. I'll tell you, if you look at a typical antidepressant that works and do a six to eight week trial, you're going to find about a moderate difference between drug and placebo. So what I can do is I can use that when I do my estimates for how many people I need because um, if I have a really big difference, you know, I'm not going to need that many, as many people to see it. I don't need as big of a microscope to see a gigantic difference. I'm going to need a huge microscope to see a tiny little difference. 
I can tell you if you go to the uh, physician's health study looking at um, aspirin effects on um, cardiac disease, what you'll see is an effect size that's 0.02. It's a tiny little effect size, but if you're in the studies that I'm, I work on, we're not really talking about life and death situations. We also can't collect tens of thousands of patients. In that study, they collected 22,000 patient data on 22,000 patients, so they were able to see a really tiny difference. And you know, my dad takes aspirin to this day because um, it's supposed to help uh, prevent heart attacks. Uh, so where you get very small effects, or the size of the effect that you need for your particular field um, could be, you know, is going to vary by the kind of field that you have. Again, in depression, we're talking about fairly moderate size effects in something like um, cardiovascular disease with an intervention like aspirin, you actually have a much, much smaller effect. If we saw an effect size of 0.02, so I would, I would describe Cohen's D as an effect size, um, something of 0.02, we would never see it with the, the kind of study sizes that we have. So why should you care? So if you remember the treadmill initially, we had different measures that you can get from the treadmill. You can have length of time uh, running or walking. You can have number of calories that you're burning. You can have uh, all kinds of different measures. So when you design a trial, if you design any kind of study, you want to have an effective measure. So here's a study that was done quite a while ago uh, in looking at manic symptoms in bipolar patients. Um, for a couple different measures that we collected, there's a young mate, whoops, make sure I get back here, the right one. Um, YMRS is a young mania scale. This is kind of an inventory of, I think it's maybe 12 or 14 questions. Um, and then all of these other measures are derived out of a daily rating that patients gave. Uh, some of these measures look at episodes, how many depressive episodes did patients have, or excuse me, manic episodes did patients have over the course of a year. Um, some of them looked at how much time did they spend in a manic state. And others looked at what was the average severity. Again, this is over the course of a year. So then, if I'm going to start a new trial, um, what, I want, what I may have is I may have all of these measures. I've got to write a protocol, and I have to pick I mean, I don't want to pick all the measures. I want to pick the one that's going to give me the maximum effect, the, the one that's going to be most sensitive to answer the question that I want to answer. So if I look here, what I see is that mean severity and the amount of time ill actually have the biggest effect sizes. Assuming that my study is going to be fairly similar to the one that this was done in, then this is what I want. I, I want measures that are more sensitive to change because it's going to be easier for me to see that change. If I took something like the number of episodes, um, it's a really small number. Some patients have none. Some have one or two. There's not a lot of variability. If I look at mean severity, there's a fair amount of variability from patient to patient, and I can use that variability to understand what's going on uh, for a larger group of patients. So you really want to, you can, you can calculate these things, maybe I'll, I'll, I can show you, tell you where to find a calculator if you want to, but it's fairly simple. If you look at a prior paper, look at the means of two groups and defined by the standard deviation in the study, then you can get this effect size. So this is the Cohen's D that I showed you a minute ago. So then how does this translate into something like a sample size? So you might say, okay, well, you know, these bars don't look that different. This is about a 0.8. This is about a 0.6. This is probably, you know, 0.3. These bars don't look that different. So if I go to design my study, what difference is it going to make? So here's the sample size that you need if you use each of these measures. Same sample size. The only thing that's different here is the effect size for these measures. So if I chose the number of episodes as my outcome measure, I'm going to need 400 to 450 patients to see a difference in my trial. If I use these, again, assuming that the results come out similar to what they had in the previous trial, I need probably 60, 70 patients total. It's a pretty big difference. 60 to 70 to 450 is a huge difference. You know, we would never do a trial here based on that. We might be able to do this. I'm not even sure we could do 150 in, in the unit that I work in. 
So these have big implications for, for the kinds of studies that you might do. Okay, so let's go past sensitivity to change and talk a little bit about the scale. Scale can be really important because some of these scales are much easier to work with than others. So a nominal scale would be um, a variable that has, let's say, two categories, or it could be multiple categories, but they're in no particular order, something like male and female. You can assign one a lower score and one a higher score. It doesn't really make that much difference. Um, there's no ranking. There's no real order to those. Um, and then you can have uh, an ordinal scale. An ordinal scale is a ranked variable. It's kind of like what place you came in in a race. The, you don't know, if you, if you see somebody came in first place, second place, third place, if it's uh, a marathon, there could be you know, a minute different between first and second, but there could be 10 minutes difference between second and third, and then five minutes difference between third and fourth. There's no way to tell from the numbers, even though they're in order, how much difference there is between one and two and two and three. If you go to an interval scale, then you have equal spacing. So if you take something like an age, if you say someone's three or four, um, you know what that time frame means. It's the same distance as four to five. So the kinds of statistics that you can do with these different scales um, can be you know, dramatically different. Um, Ratio scales, you see very rarely, but you can see these are things that have an absolute zero. You might think about these as something like hospitalizations. And then just here's kind of an example of each of one of these. So something like diagnosis, um, you might say it's like a yes-no variable. There's no necessarily, not necessarily any order. Um, you could assign any number to yes and no. It doesn't really make that much difference. Um, an ordinal scale might be like the stage of an illness. So the difference between phase two and three might be different than the distance between phase three and four. Um, severity of illness, you may have a score from zero to 60, for example. And probably for most of questionnaires, you're probably assuming that the difference between two and three is about the same as the difference between three and four. Um, but there is some meaningful difference. And then a ratio scale might be something like the number of doctor visits. You could theoretically have none, I suppose. That um, would be pretty unusual. Um, so again, these can be really important because of the kind of statistics that you do, but they do have some implications, particularly for clinical research. So a lot of times people um, use sort of subcategories here. So a continuous scale is usually an interval scale. Sometimes it could be ratio, but generally it's an interval scale. Um, a categorical scale would usually be something that's nominal. It doesn't really have any order. Um, but these are um, issues that you would see pretty commonly in any kind of literature talking about continuous and categorical scales. So there's um, a fair amount of debate. This actually, this issue comes up a lot of times in my group, is how to work with different kinds of variables. So for example, in my group, um, and let me just go to the next slide. So what this is here is this is um, the per we, have a, we work with a drug that um, causes changes in depression very quickly. So it's standard antidepressant works in about six to eight weeks. You see significant changes. Um, this one happens to work within a matter of hours. So this is a change in depression at day one. So negative values are going to be improvement. Positive values are going to be worsening. So this is the distribution. So this is just the number of people who have this level of improvement at day one. So what commonly happens in our field is that if you reach a level where you have a 50% improvement, people want to say that those individuals are responders to a drug. They've actually gotten better. Anything less than that, they would call non-responders. So if I go back to this for a second, so if I use the whole range of values, I'm, I'm using the continuous value, that's pretty good. That works out really well if you are looking just at general outcomes, how much in general do people improve. Um, but a lot of times, clinicians in particular like to talk about, okay, who actually got better versus who did not. And a lot of people would like to compare responders versus non-responders instead of taking advantage of the entire scale. So the concern with moving away from a continuous measure like this is 
do you really want to say that the people who have 45 to 49 percent improvement are different than the people who have 50 to 54 percent improvement? It's a pretty small difference, but by putting in a line here and dividing this group into responders and this group into non-responders is, you know, you might say fairly arbitrary. There's a standard in the field, um, but if you have a fairly normal distribution like this one, um, it gets to be really difficult for where do you draw that line. Um, it could be a, a pretty big challenge. Um, but at the same time, um, I understand from a clinical standpoint, just like you probably have, if you want to give someone a diagnosis, you probably have certain criteria that they have to meet. There could be somebody who meets all but one of the criteria, but that person's not going to get a diagnosis. You have to meet all the criteria to get a diagnosis. So you may have situations like this where you could be very close, but not quite over the line. Well, among the difficulties for going to the categorical approach is you're losing all of this variability. So the responders, just within that group, there's a fair amount, fair amount of variability of response. In the non-responders, there's also a fair amount of variability for what's going on here. So you lose information, um, but you also may be able to talk about um, who gets better and who doesn't get better by making these fairly arbitrary decisions. Um, so a lot of things that people like to talk about when they talk about um, something like responders or non-responders is coming up with a new test. So doing some things with biomarkers, um, people like to do things like take an imaging value like glucose metabolism, for example, in a particular region of the brain and say that, okay, people who have high levels are maybe likely to be responders and people who have low levels might be more likely to be non-responders. So again, what you have to do, what people like to do is make a division there to say if you reach some level, then you're going to be more likely to have a characteristic like being a responder to a drug, for example. So then some of the language used around these categories, um, you surely heard sensitivity and specificity. So sensitivity refers to if you have an illness, what's the, what's the probability that you get a positive test? So if I'm saying that you're going to be a responder if you have higher glucose metabolism, um, if you actually have, if you are actually are a responder, what's the likelihood that you in fact have higher glucose metabolism? In a perfect world, um, only the people who were responders would have that high level. If you look at things like pregnancy tests, really high sensitivity, really high specificity. So if you have an illness, um, it's probably pretty likely that you're going to get a positive test. Or if you have, here I'm saying illness, you know, if it's pregnancy, if you're pregnant, you're probably very likely to get a positive test. Specificity has to do with if you don't have an illness, or in this case, if you're a non-responder, how likely is it that you'll have a negative test? Okay? So this is the way that people generally talk about categorizing people, trying to predict um, a clinical response or non-response, or um, how well a test is going to work. What often gets missed is that there's another way of looking at the same values. I'll give you an, an example in, in a few minutes. For example, um, instead of looking at from the perspective of the illness, what about looking from the perspective of the test? So let's say that you, so we had a famous person who announced this morning uh, he had a positive test for an illness. Um, if you get a positive test, what's the likelihood that you have the illness? That's not the question you're asking with sensitivity and specificity. Um, so if you're, if you're interested in what's the result or what's the likelihood of having an illness when you get a positive test, you want to know the positive predictive value. So what you probably will see if you read articles that talk about sensitivity and specificity, you probably, will, you probably have already started to see people talk about positive predictive values. Because patients want to know, well, if I get a positive test, what does that mean? What's the chance that I have it? Or what's the chance that I don't? And at the same time, if you get a negative test, um, you could still have the illness. But if you get a negative test, what's the chance that you don't have the illness? So one place, actually, this has come up in, in, in some of uh, the work that I do is in... Um, Quite a while back, uh, we were looking at some data on children who um, were diagnosed with bipolar disorder. 
And among the things that uh, we saw in one study was that uh, if you just looked at the kids who had bipolar disorder, they had these huge levels of irritability. Um, so then if I take um, irritability as my test and say, okay, it's positive, um, can I definitely say that they would have bipolar disorder? Um, it turned out, actually, that um, you really couldn't do that because a lot of kids who have any kind of um, childhood mental health um, related concerns or psychiatric psychological issues um, actually had a fair amount of irritability. Bipolar kids maybe had more, um, but you really couldn't use irritability to discriminate between the two groups very well. So let me give you a different example. So here's just uh, a simple example of um, how numbers could come out in a table in a paper. So if you're interested in sensitivity and specificity, again, you're going to go from the vantage point of the illness. If you actually have an illness, what's the probability that you're going to get a positive test? That's sensitivity. So in this case, having a positive, um, if you have an illness, there's about an 80% chance you get a positive test. In this case here, and this, this is not the irritability thing that I mentioned, this is something else. Um, in this case, if you don't have the illness, there's a 55% chance that you get a negative test. So that means there's still a 45% chance that you get a positive test, even if you don't have the illness. So these things can get really important when you start to see, again, things like pregnancy tests. These values are in the, like, 0.999 range. They're very high values. Um, a lot of the things you see for biomarkers are more along these lines, probably. Some of them are probably going to be better than this. So then let's go. So here it looks like, okay, well, you know, this gives you a little bit of information about what's going on here. Let's go to um, looking at the positive predictive value. So again, this is the same table, same numbers here. So now here, if I talk about pretty much as the patient coming in, okay, I just got a positive test. How likely is it that I have an illness? Well, it looks like 75% chance that you actually have the illness if you got a positive test. That's the positive predictive value. So essentially, um, how much... Uh, how much does a positive predictive value, how much does a positive test predict that you have an illness? And then negative predictive value is how much does a negative um, test indicate that you don't have an illness? So here you would say 61% of the people who got a negative test did not have the illness, which also means 39% actually had the illness with a negative test. So there's not such a great test. Um, Again, here you, you have fairly, um, you know, they're not tremendously high values. It's, it's difficult. You can make some prediction here, maybe, um, but you're going to be wrong a lot of the time. So let me go back to the example with irritability. So what this graph is, is this graph is, um, it gives you an idea of the proportion of patients who have more irritability symptoms than a control group. So what you can see here is at about age 10, 11, 12, bipolar patients had a much higher level of irritability than other. These were um, mostly uh, other kids who had things like ADHD um, and other kind of things that might be treated by a psychiatrist or a psychologist. So there's like a 50% increase here. The problem here, though, is that about 80% of the bipolar kids had irritability and about 30% of the other kids had irritability. So I couldn't look at irritability as a test to say, how do I diagnose this kind of person? You might use irritability as part of your factors, but you'd actually have to use a lot of other things. This is just kind of one illustration of how you might use some of these um, clinical issues. So we've talked about the main things, validity, reliability, sensitivity to change, and scale. So let's talk a little bit about the feasibility of a measure. So what kind of other things do you need to worry about? So 
although I talked all about effect sizes and reliability, validity, if you end up having to pay a lot for a test, um, chances are you're, you're probably not going to use it. Um, so the cost um, can be a lot of things. It can be um, the actual payment that you have to get for a test. I know that I see um, people getting different kind of genetic kits, and if you need hundreds of them, they get really expensive really fast. Um, so the cost definitely uh, is a big issue, and the cost goes not only in terms of money, but it's also in terms of time. So time can play a big role here because in some of our studies, we have very rapid time frames that we need to examine patients. We have one study that looks at patients at 40 minutes. Uh, it's basically right at the end of getting an infusion. They're trying to evaluate patients. Um, and then the next interval is another 40 minutes later. They have a variety of different kind of uh, measurements that they want to take, but they only have sort of 40 minute time range to do it in. So if you have a scale that's going to take you, you know, 20, 30 minutes, you're probably not going to be able to do anything else. So you need to think about how long is the scale going to take. All those things with sensitivity to change, reliability, validity, sometimes you may have to give up a little bit in order to fit it into the kind of time frame you want. Sometimes you just have to do fewer measures, and that actually can work out fairly well. The other thing I want to mention has to do with environment. So I mentioned sensitivity to change. Um, one of the things that's really interesting um, in some of the depression research with this is that uh, what we found is that some depression scales work much better with certain kinds of drugs than others do. Um, one scale works pretty well if you do studies of SSRIs. Another does really well if you do work with tricyclics. Um, so you have to be careful about which scale you use in which situation. Probably what's the case is that the emphasis in terms of symptoms for one of the scales is stronger and more related to the kinds of symptoms that are treated by one class of drug. Um, but you also have to think about um, things like um, the, um, are, are patients going to do, um, do a rating scale? Are they going to have to perform some task? Um, a lot of times in our group we have a lot of different uh, reaction time uh, measures, or they may have to fill out questionnaires. And not only do clinicians have to do things, but the patients have to do things. So you have to be concerned about that. There may be some cases where um, the patient's not going to be capable of doing a certain kind of rating, um, whether it's not having kind of insight into an illness um, or may not be sensitive to the kind of changes that you're seeing. Um, more than likely, you wouldn't want a patient to report their blood pressure. You'd probably rather have um, put the blood pressure cuff off and take a measure. Um, you could just ask the patient. It's going to be a quick, uh, maybe it's sort of a ridiculous example, but it's going to be a quick measurement, but it's probably not going to be very accurate. Um, so by and large, you have to think about the environment, how well your scales are going to fit into the environment you have. You have to make sure that you have enough time. An important aspect of testing any kind of new measure is seeing how long it takes. Um, if it, if an, a new measure is really similar to an old one, you probably would prefer the one that's going to take less time. So you can look at your convergent validity, and then you can also look at, is one shorter, or is it going to give me the same information without having to take so much time? Um, and at the same time, you have comparable scales. Um, is one going to cost me a lot more, uh, whether in time or other kinds of resources? So here I wanted to, in, in the handouts that I gave you, I didn't have this, um, or I think the slides that they put online, they did not have this one article in the middle by Helena Kramer. She has some really good, this is kind of a more current um, article. Uh, at some point somebody mentioned that some of the articles were a little old. One of the things I like about some of the older articles is that you can follow through Scopus or PubMed. You can see who cited the article and a lot of times find some very relevant articles. Um, so this is one more recent article I, by Helena Kramer, um, who was a statistician at Stanford for a long time, and then at Pitt, worked mainly in psychiatry. And um, she has some very good suggestions on how to evaluate clinical measures. Um, she has a nice list of different kind of characteristics, some of them we've talked about today, uh, but there's also some things that she didn't talk about too well. So I think whenever you're thinking about your clinical measures, think about um, 
Are you going to have things that measure a construct that you're interested in? Are you going to be able to measure them consistently? And are you going to be able to find a measure that actually can detect the kind of changes that you want to see in a clinical trial? So I hope that was useful information. I know they're kind of basic information on the kinds of measures that you use, but uh, again, I hope that was helpful. Do you have questions? Okay. No questions? Okay, well, thank you very much.